Thank you, Sarah. Um, can you all hear me okay? This mic is very close, so it feels a little bit intrusive. Okay. Um, but if you, in the back here, Michael's, okay, great, thank you. Um, so thank you, Sarah. I'd like to thank also, um, uh, sorry, uh, 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 Gwendolyn Alain, where I don't see you, but thank you. And also thanks to Marta Gilles for, Gilles for the uh, invitation and for all the work done to prepare my visit in a very hurried uh, lapse of time. I want to thank also Michael Lorio and the fabulous group of Alset students from Northwestern who've come from Evanston to Paris and now to Arles um, to learn about French culture, uh, sort of in situ as it were, and um, so for giving us all reason to be here together. And thanks to those of you who are here um, from Arles. It's nice to be here. And um, I will say also this is not a, a customary um, talk mode for me. I usually stand at a lectern with no mic, so if I seem suddenly to bang it or something, you'll forgive me, I hope. So by way of preamble, um, I'll just let you know that I had originally planned to talk about something else today, which for a number of reasons uh, didn't work out. Um, and so we decided it might be interesting were I to present work from um, the book that was just mentioned, um, which is from A Nation Torn. Here it is, right here. From a nation torn, decolonizing art and representation in France from 1945 to 1962. Um, these are the decades that I claim to describe as uh, not post-war, as they were frequently described in the nomenclature of my discipline, art history, but instead to think about them as decades of decolonization. Um, and I start them in 1945, because at the same moment that World War II ended, uh, it was also the very beginning or the continuation for some of the um, advance to Algerian sovereignty uh, in 1945 with the uh, attacks against the Algerians in two towns of Setif and Gilma. Um, so in particular, the work I'm presenting comes from the fifth chapter of that book, which is called With an Eye and a Debt to George D.D. Uberman, The Eye of History. And in this chapter, I analyze the photographic representation and its subsequent refusal of the manifestation of October 17th, 1961, when so-called or so understood Algerians from across the metropole marched in Paris, demanding their right to share space with the French compatriots. At the time of my research, the images I analyzed were considered forgotten, or worse, it was denied that they never even existed as such against all evidence to the contrary. It's amazing, someone's looking at a picture and saying there were no pictures. So um, it was in that framework that my ideas were first articulated. And the, I should say the scene has changed a bit. These images that were so refused in the 2010s have a much greater circulation now. So there's some sort of revision that would have to come if we thought about the implications. And it's for some of that reason that I've tried to expand the focus of the talk to consider some more recent um, demonstrations um, and how they invoke uh, the kinds of frameworks of visibility established in, during the um, Algerian War of Liberation. Um, what I'm hoping to do by expanding is that we might see the long durée of the implications of the Algerian War of Liberation in particular and decolonization more generally on theories and histories of visuality. Two, the transition from use of images as tactical, where one, wherein one would use the reins of representation meant to oppress bodies, instead to exalt them in plain sight. Two, three, what I argue now today is the acquiescence of the image and more of the body within the image to a model of consensus that even when asserting dissensus only confirms the authority of the state to define the difference and so renders null and void the hard fought for frissures uh, necessary to decolonize. This visible commons, the one we live in today, reverses that anti and decolonial thought fought for such that it becomes an invisible commons. I'll touch on that at the end of the talk. The image of this com commons, I think, remains an image of the same. It's just another image. The image we might say today doesn't belong to its producer. The producer belongs to the image, generalized and ready-made. The producer performs the image, but I'm now getting ahead of myself, and so I will come back to this. So today we look at three sets of images stemming from three moments of mass assembly in the French capital, one in 1961, one in 1962, and one in 2015. 
We also look at images they inspired or with which they resonated to remind us of the contingencies and overlaps of historical trauma. In this case, uh, World War II and the Holocaust, and then the trauma of the Algerian War. Some of the images are hard to see, uh, so please keep that in mind, and I understand if you need to close your eyes. Uh, it's a long talk, and will walk us through the layered histories of Arab and uh, anti-Arab and uh, anti-Semitic thought in the Paris landscape, theories of philosophy, theories and philosophies of visuality and space, photographs, and three different protests. So it's a kind of fasten your seatbelt, bumpy ride, a lot of stuff to do. Um, okay. On the evening of 17th October 1961, something of the order of 20,000 to 30,000 Algerian men, women, and children took to the streets of Paris where they were met with murderous force by approximately 7,000 police and CRS, or riot police, officers who had been mobilized by the prefect of police, Maurice Papon, for, as the historical record has repeatedly affirmed, precisely that purpose, murderous force. For every one of ours, Papon had declares, we will take 10 of theirs. Papon is reported to have, um, for every one of ours, we will take 10 of theirs. Papon is reported to have proclaimed to a police force grown weary from the renewed FLN, which was a national liberation front or underground arm of the Algerian resistance. For every one of their attack, he, the, excuse me, the police had become uh, fatigued by attacks on their numbers throughout the fall of 1961. Although debates about the precise count of those murdered by the police on the night of the 17th and in the days immediately following are still subject to debate, consensus amongst most historians now suggests that the number of unarmed protesters who met their death by shooting, beating, drowning, or some combination of the three during the night of 17th of October and in the days just following exceeds 100 and reaches perhaps closer to two. Certainly, the number is more than the original three deaths that the police seated in a press release at the time, in which they announced that it was the FLN who had initiated the quote-unquote Battle of Paris by opening fire on the police who had therefore been forced to do, quote, what was necessary, unquote, to maintain public order. Such efforts to police the public record were typical of the official stance regarding the event and not unironically, much of the attempt attempts to recuperate it as part of the historical record in both French and Algerian accounts of Algeria's mid-century advance to sovereignty in the, ne and the, nearly, in the nearly 50 years since. Officially consecrated with the plaque on the Quai de Marché Neuf adjacent to the Pont Saint-Michel, one, one of the important sites of police brutality and mass drownings, in 2001, 40 years later, with a very small plaque, in this picture hard to see, the date is now commemorated as, quote, a day of remembrance in France, unquote, and the National Day of Emigration in Algeria. And yet, as a historian Joshua Cole has suggested in qualification of this fact, most of what gets remembered in France is the forgetting of 17th of October 1961, which is to say, quote, the disappearance from public discourse of a massacre that occurred in plain sight. Cole's analysis is both acute and instructive. In summarizing the predominant characteristic of much of the by now voluminous body of uh, uh, body of writing regarding how the incorporation of the event into national consciousness has been stunted by the bureaucratic, read political, closure of the archives and a corresponding failure of collective memorialization, he also nods to an important consequence of a good deal of academic treatment of the disenfranchisement of the disenfranchised. In analyzing the disenfranchisement of those removed from the same opportunities for belonging and representation in the price precise terms of their disenfranchisement, such work ends by further distancing those same bodies from any other power, discursive or otherwise, to which they might aspire alternatively. In turn, the power of the institutions that do the enfranchising is bolstered by a relational diagrammatic that rewards the means by which it excludes with further study. To be blunt or frank, the constant remembering of the original forgetting or repression of 17th of October 1961 puts the burden of the event and the analysis of the agencies evolved squarely in the arena of the same public authority originally responsible for having quote unquote disappeared the event, not to mention the bodies. 
Looking <clears throat> at the, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at the manifestation, however, as what Maurice de Certeau once identified as a tactic of the weak, requires us to look elsewhere. It requires us to imagine, yet again, what it was that happened, quote unquote, in plain sight. <clears throat> and moreover, what something like plain sight might have been in the 1950s and early 1960s. Whose was it? How was it policed, protected, and how was it possibly appropriated? So in what follows, I want to look at the considerable body of public photographs, what I've els elsewhere called actually an archive of excess, full of images of excess, which is to say far from invisible, despite claims made by, for example, uh, Jacques Rancière, who's one of the few to speak of the event visually before I did, to acknowledge it as a visual event. Um, and even he, uh, well-intended, uh, uh, frames it as one of absence, and I'll speak more about this later, um, of the events as evidence, not that something had happened, which it did. I want to speak about the photographs as evidence, not that something happened, which it did, but as documents about why it happened, as clues to the visual politics the FLN meant to employ tactically. I want to develop a model of plain sight, a phrase I will ascribe to that which the FLN Federation meant to employ, and which it meant to draw upon in contradiction to the supervisory surveillance of the state. I chose the term in decided contrast to the term spectacular, which began to assume its place in the annals of aesthetic practice at around this time. Whereas for Guy Debord, in his seminal theory of specta le spectacle, where he drew on language of the theater and cinema, as well as on the model of television's intrusion into the spaces of private life to articulate what he would eventually lament as, quote, capital accumulated to the point where it becomes image, unquote, and which he characterized by separation and the severing of subjects from their proper experiences, plain sight means instead to foreground a model of closeness, everydayness, and averageness. Every these are no slight, there are no slights of hand in plain sight. In fact, the term derives from a non-telescopic sight or device meant to assist in taking aim. Despite the bevy of attention the manifestation has received in literary and historical analyses of the last two decades, now three, and despite its literal reenactment on the screen in two films and its deliberate non-reenactment in Michael Haneke's cachet, Little has been said about how the, how the march or its suppression were, in fact, seen, even though it has been insisted upon again and again that subsequent to the 17th of October 1961 date itself, it was never again made visible until the so-called memory activists recuperated the events in the 1980s. Ignoring the body of evidence that reports, in fact, how it was seen and that it was not only obscures the achievements of the manifestation, but also deprives us of the opportunity to understand how witnessing, photographic witnessing no less, can be turned into its absence, uh, excuse me, into its opposite, absence, <clears throat> separation, and amnesia. In 1988, Guy Debord wrote that the society of the spectacle was already 40 years old in 1967. Drawing on this claim, Jonathan Crary has suggested that spectacle took root in this order, in the technological perfection of television, the implementation of sync sound in the movies and the rise of fascism, and with it, the devaluation of the word in favor of sound image propaganda. If, in fact, these are the correlates that Debord is thinking about, the reasons he does so might well be found in a reconvergence of these same factors in the early 1960s, which is to say the time that France was fighting to keep Algeria French. One, the recourse to fascism and a military government in Algeria, to be slightly reductive about it. Two, the proliferation of cinema culture on the boulevards. And three, restriction in the literary public sphere in favor of a televisual apparatus that was largely controlled by the state. And yet, as another thinker of spectacle at this moment, Henri Lefebvre, um, as his writings make clear, by the early 1960s, spectacle was still deeply attached to the associative connotations of theater, fete, and parade, notions that would have informed his own development of the term and his intermittent conviction that if there was something positive in the term, that there was something positive in the term that should be upheld from de Boer's denunciation. So in other words, there's a positive take on what spectacle might be. I'm going to skip um, 
this image and the explanation, um, but just wanted to leave you with the visual, uh, which shows us some very nice roundabouts, and you might see it come back to us in different forms. And such is the case with the images of the manifestation, such this positive aspect of spectacularity, uh, with the images of the manifestation of 17 uh, October 1961. Sorry, I'm skipping these televisual things. This is really for another conversation. Such is the case with the images of the manifestation of 17 October 1961, which I want to consider in a similar frame of self-presentation, the one that refuses passive spectatorship to forge again a plain sight out of spectacle. What it is not at all clear that de Bord ever gave much thought, if any at all, to 17th of October 1961, it is decidedly clear that the organizers of the march, the FLN in France, were thinking about spectacle which is to say that they were thinking of not only the kind of mediatic image that photojournalistic reporting would manifest, but also the subject who was ready to receive precisely this kind of information in this duration and in this format. They were also thinking about spectacle specific insistence on, inter on intersecting the architectural and urban forms of Paris on the sim simultaneous levels of bodily presence and image. And this we know from two things, one, the specific wording of the FLN called to manifest, which insisted the manifestation must be, in fact, quote, spectaculaire. Two, the multiple paths the marchers took through the city, all of which defined the nature of what it was that the FLN Federation understood to be spectacular in the city, in the city which was not incidentally... Um, which was, not incidentally, located on the grand arteries of Paris, in the boulevards, Saint-Michel, Saint-Germain, and Montmartre. These were, again, not incidentally, not only home to the city's spaces of leisure, but so too its journalistic headquarters. Asked later why they had um, chose, chosen these sites, one of the FLN organizers replied, because people would be there, journalists would be there. A move that echoes, for some, Martin Luther King Jr.'s planning of the Selma March as one he knew would be spectacularly photographed even if and as it became violent. While the consequences of the police repression, the near 200 dead and more deported and injured and so on, are now well known, those that condition the call to manifest remain less so, and so this is an opportune time to review them briefly as they provide the first indication of the visual thinking that underscored the FLN's call to manifest and to manifest spectacularly, as well as what, what it might mean to employ spectacle as a tactic or a tool of war. While not the first demonstration relating to this war, this was the first since the FLN had declared France a second front in August 1958, second time, that the Algerian populations in and around Paris had been summoned by Federation leadership to make themselves visible within the space of the capital city. October 17th then was unique in that it marked the first time that the FLN employed this mass and their appearance in a space removed from the site and object of their struggle, which is to say Algeria. Um, their manifestation was not one for national sovereignty, but rather specifically to contest a, a curfew that the prefect of police, Maurice Papon, had issued some 12 days prior, and which was specifically intended to impact only, only um, Algerians, quote unquote, and which was presented as a security measure in response to the FLN murder of 11 police. But the curfew was more than a preventative tactic. It was also an active component of Papon's policing policies, the likes of which he had perfected in Algeria before his return to Paris in 1958, when he was the prefect of Constantine. In order to avoid strict conflict with the laws of the 1958 Constitution of the Fifth Republic, which formally reinstated the Algerians' rights as French in Paris and in Algeria, um, and then <clears throat> in order to avoid breaking that law, uh, the curfew was very careful to single out a group that first defined, that was first defined as Algerian workers and then redefined as French Muslims before finally resolving itself as, quote, French Muslims from Algeria. And while it could not legally disallow movements without calling a state of emergency, 
The curfew strongly cautioned those in this group against circulating during the night in the streets of Paris or in the suburbs after 8.30 and before 5.30 a.m. The classificatory order of the administrative gaze upheld by the police bears noting as it relies upon the same logic of differentiation employed by the mechanisms of identification cards, papers, photographs, that had also become central to policing efforts in Algeria. And these are photographs by Marc Granger, who was sent as a military conscript uh, to take photos um, to define and locate local populations. Such complicity between photography and surveillance has become an important part of photographic theory and is fed backwards into our apprehensions that the photographic sign is always spectacular. The category of FMA, or French Muslims of Algeria, was also, and remains as such, a visual category and a rather anxious one. It was based on this attribute that it was meant to function as a political rather than a religious marker. Then, as now, the determination and distinction that one is a French Muslim from Algeria can only function on the basis of the privileging of appearance over actuality. How, whether, how other than an agreed upon register of visual difference that gauges difference only in comprehensive totality judged against a hegemonic image of same, sameness, <clears throat> might one distinguish a French Muslim from Algeria from, for instance, a French Catholic from Spain, or from that matter, from a French Jew or Christian from Algeria? In face, <clears throat> in face of Papon's prejudicial and only visually enforceable uh, curfew, the Federation leadership organized an opportunity that was to be equally orchestrated on the level of appearance. They saw in the prohibition of a, possibil a possibility of seizing the reins of representation in order to endow their cause with a kind of mediatic publicity that was at that time increasingly organizing specular regimes of power. As Charles de Gaulle's own savvy manipulation of a state manage, uh, managed television attests, Working specifically to detourne and so undermine the ways that the surveillance capacities of photography were being employed in the project of disciplining colonial subjects, they drew on lessons learned from the impact of the massive but spontaneous manifestations in Algiers on 11th, 11 December of 1960s, which were popularly credited as the stimulus to the peace talks, as getting all of the international players to the peace talks to advance the cause of Algerian uh, nationhood. Working, therefore, to undermine the chauvinism that bolstered the French will to make Algerian subjects as invisible as possible within the entire trans-Mediterranean stretch of the French nation, or as those Garanger photographs I just showed you were meant to attest, visible as only identifiably, as on, visible only as identifiable others, the Federation determined to institute a generalized boycott of the curfew. Prioritizing the visibility of the mass and the long-term images of their spatial inhabitation, the FLN choreographed the march through the major arteries of the cities, past its entertainments, its movie theaters, its opera houses, its grandest cafes, and crucially, the editorial offices of its major newspapers. When we look carefully at the past these marchers commandeered through the city, or at least those who made it past the police forces sent to the periphery to stop them, we realize that indeed the FLN's investment in making visible with Papon, Papon, his police, and the governmental interests they represented had wished to make invisible. They did not march past or gather in front of such symbolic sites of that of the Bastille, where the origins of the French Republican government are rooted. In this, for example, nor did they march in front of the Hotel de Ville or the Presidential Palace, etc. In this instance, their interruption was meant to force a reconsideration specifically of the French capital spaces of leisure, and in fact depended upon entering into these same spaces, real or discursive. The right that they were claiming was what, in essence, Henri Lefebvre would articulate six, six years later as the right to the city. The image that they generated was on the order of that appropriate, appropriated city, Lefebvre advocated planning, one wherein, quote, imagination is deployed, not the imaginary of escape and evasion which conveys ideologies, but the imaginatory, which invests itself in appropriation of time, of space, physiolocal life, and desire, unquote. 
cutting through the city's touristic heart and bisecting the commercial areas that had been denied to the marchers despite their legal right, rights to enjoy precisely the same entertainments available to their citizen others, the French, the marchers commandeered a path between spectacle and the public sphere to situate those MFAs within an urban terrain that had rendered not only available but entirely unattainable to them. A photo taken by an anonymous photojournalist but collected in the archives of photographer Jacques Boisset provides a case in point. The picture shows a mass of protesters, several hundred deep, paused in their march in front of, in front of what was then the rather remarkable Marquis of the Berlitz Theatre, located at the Grand Junction of the Boulevard des Italiens and the Rue de la Michaudière in the veritable heart of the Grand Boulevard. Out of context, it might even appear that the picture documents a crowd waiting for the opening of a particularly popular film premiere. Indeed, the top half of the night scene is illuminated from above by the glow of a few arched street lamps, and from behind by the neon lights spelling out the name of the film, Le Cave Cerebif, or Screw the Suckers, which was then playing at the Berlitz Theater. The lights spell out the name of the director, G. Grangier, as well as that of the star of his newest caper, Jean Gabin, who takes top billing for his role as a master counterfeiter newly returned to France from a tropic retreat. The irony secured by the well-lit face of the man made famous for his role as Pepe Le Moco in the, in the famous 1937 Orientalist film of the same name, in which the young Gabin takes refuge from the police in the lamb labyrinthine streets of Algiers Casbah was not lost, perhaps, on the photographer. Certainly, in purely formal terms, one of the tensions animating the picture takes root in the discrepancy between Gabin's rather dour, pallid countenance and that of the crowd over whom his, space, his image presides, a crowd made up almost exclusively, but not entirely, of men, and almost exclusively of brown-skinned ones at that. Like Gabin, the man in the crowd are mostly visible from the chin up. Their short cropped dark hair echoes the dark hat perched atop his head, and one man's reduplicates it entirely. Lit by the radiance spilling forth from the star's name, the men on the left side of the picture reflect contentment, even enthusiasm. Further back and to the right, some hands are lifted in the air, uh, almost as if in an interrupted clap. And the rear of the column seems anxious to peer the heads over the heads of those in front of them. They wear raincoats and many sport ties and jackets, presumably their finest, or what the literature on the topic routinely insists upon as their, quote, Sunday best, despite the fact that Sunday best refers to a manner of dress associated with uh, Sunday Christian church going. In the very center of the photograph, almost directly beneath Jean Gabin himself, stands a well-dressed man, he stands completely erect and faces the viewer directly, the picture dividing into two equal halves along the carefully buttoned buttons of his light-colored overcoat, up the line and knot of his tie, through the V of his sweater's neck, along the perfectly symmetrical contours of his profile, and through the seam of the marquee itself. So here we have him. My striking, however, is his gaze, which returns calmly and with the slightest hint of a smile, that of the photographer. He seems quite aware of posing, of inviter, inviting the viewer to look at him and to make of him an image like that of the hero criminal Gabin some 50 feet above him. This picture is rather remarkable for all that it shows as well as what it doesn't show, but what it might well have evoked for an attentive viewer in the epoch. Indeed, drawing upon memories of the city's textured and historical layers, the, the photograph carries within itself the prescient premonition of how the march will end, as well as the key to understanding the image politics that motivated the FLN to march in the first place and which determined its route. Indeed, the Palais Berlitz was in and of itself a rather famous building, less so for its architecture than for the history of its interior before it became a movie theater in 1950. The facade of the palace, named after the English language school Berlitz that moved from just down the street, actually dates to 1932 when the original facade of what was then the Pavilion Hanover, built between 1758 and 1760 in what had once been the gardens of the Duc de Richelieu, was moved to the Parc des Sceaux, and a new, even more monumental building was orchestrated. 
As befits such a monumental site, however, it was a rather monumental exhibition that would mark its history. It was here that the infamous La France et les Juifs delighted, entertained, and enthralled viewers in the late months of 1941 through 1942, where Gabin's face shone forth in the fall of 1961, 40 years earlier had leered a caricature of an old Jew, the crooked bends of his long nailed fingers greedily prying into a globe wrapped in his arms. Drawn directly from Charles Theodore Perron's allegorical sculpture that was positioned to stand two, uh, posi excuse me, positioned to stand two stories tall in the exhibition's entrance, the poster announced the intents of the exhibition. Organized by the Institut d'Etudes des Questions Juives, a private institution founded by a French man, but funded by the Germans, the exhibition opened its doors to free France and those who might travel from elsewhere in early September of 1941. When it closed just over four months later, 200,000 visitors, the 100,001 first of whom was offered a present, had paid for the privilege of seeing the exhibition's array of quote unquote scientific documentation and its array of sculptural and photographic representation, all of which aimed to demonstrate the degree to which the Jewish population had infiltrated and overcome French society as well as the deleterious effects of the same, including nothing less than the fall of France in 1940. <clears throat> the display items in La France et les Juifs had intended to make Jews more recognizable and hence more visible. Such a mission would be echoed in the subsequent law of 29 May 1942, which legalized the rule that Jews over the age of six wear a yellow star. Marked and thus easily identified by the star, the Jews became newly distinct, just as the exhibition's reliance on typology and phrenology had hoped the Jew might be. Following the May law, the Jews newly achieved visibility on the streets of Paris, where otherwise they might not have been seen, which was the fear. Um, following the law, um, the Jews newly achieved visibility uh, on the streets of Paris led predictably to a surge of uh, resentment from anti-Semitic organs. It was only one month subsequently that Adolf Eichmann issued the decree that French Jews would join those being deported to camps in the East regardless of their citizenship. The infamous roundup at the Veldif, during which over 10,000 Jews were rounded up and held in Parisian sporting stadium, stadiums before being deported, took place yet one month later, on the 16th and 17th of the July. According to historians G. Perrault and Pierre Azama, the press gave, quote, as much column space to the great roundup of July 16th through 17th, 1942, as to the opening of the new cabaret, Le Florence. Not much. And here is how we assume the spectacle to have taken hold in determining reality, even as it can't refute history, and that kinds of reporting history. The associative links between the roundup at the Veldif and the 17th of October manifestation are, of course, deeper than the site of the photograph I showed you, as has been noted in the days following the 1961 manifesta manifestation to the present day. The most poignant of these comparisons was made actually in the page of France Observateur, where a photo taken surreptitiously by an army sergeant in one of the internment centers a few days after what unfolded as the 1961 roundup ran next to an article by the French Algerian poet Henri Crea about racism amongst the working class with the caption, the Algerians at the Palais des Sports, does that not make you remember anything? For the purposes of this analysis, however, what is, not a, what is most important remains the way in which both episodes highlight the way in which visibility, and to an even more specific degree, urban visibility, was employed as a strategy to police difference. The 1942 lament cited above singles out to be clear the invasion-like manifestation, so-called, i.e. appearance of Jews on the streets of Paris. In this instance, the yellow star and the visibility it imparts were meant to provide the police a tool to survey and control the population. Not surprisingly, the curfew that had elicited the FLN manifestation was similarly intended as a police maneuver wherein registers of space and visibility were similarly collapsed. In contrast to such manipulations, the FLN proposed to draw upon the illegality of their presence to announce it. 
if only for a moment, to announce their intention to inhabit, in the Lefebvrean sense, the city. For Lefebvre, this assertion of this right to inhabit the city constituted, constituted a fundamental revolt against the neat and clearly prejudicial parceling out of the space of the city, and thus marked an attempt at social transformation, much as a demand for bread had once done so famously in the 18th century. For the 30,000 Algerians who marched, this right to the city spoke to their will to exceed metaphorically and literally the cramped and impoverished spaces, also metaphorical and literal, accorded to colonial subjects. Their eruption into the space of Paris inscribed their refusal of the colony across the very heart of the colonial empire and thus imaged for history the colonial models that de Gaulle's uh, administration was hoping to obliterate from public view. And indeed, in 2022, it was revealed that de Gaulle himself knew about the events and Pepin's complicity and failed to bring anyone to trial. Um, uh, the stakes of what such a belonging in precisely this urban space entails are well demonstrated by a history of representation that has helped to produce them. Even the most cursory glance through the canon of boulevard paintings recalls what is at stake here. The distribution of rights to the city based on the visual mastery of a scene and seeing subject. Indeed, it is the possibility of seeing and being seen that were then claims that were the claims championed by Gustave Caillebotte's famous Paris rainy day painting, or in the view presented by the man by his man looking from a balcony. In the wake of urban, in the wake of the urban degagement that Eugène Haussmann had imposed upon Second Empire Paris. While many avant-garde groups had attempted to upset these orders of urban space and control, their efforts remained limited to cartographic experiments. The marchers, on the other hand, managed to remake, albeit briefly and elusively, the actual fabric of the city itself to inscribe Algeria at the heart of France. And to do so, they relied on the apparatus of spectacle. And yet this appearance, which you've seen several images of quite forcefully. This appearance remains the least attended to aspect of the march as suggested above in references to the importance given the nearly simultaneous disappearance of the bodies and it would seem their image. Spoken word and written testimonials of course all insist upon the visual aspects of what individual witnesses saw and what by implication they observed others seeing. Most of the accounts emphasize four things. One, they were stunned to see such groups of Algerians in these part of the cities. It was completely unheard of, unseen before. Two, the manifestors were resolutely peaceful in their presentation. Three, they were carefully shepherded and heralded by FLN um, coordinates. And four, the violence and chaos that ensued when the police opened fire was extreme. The archive that I pieced together from various public and private collections, as well as a number of photojournalist agencies, demonstrates the emphasis of the March planners placed on achieving visibility and doing so within a specific spatial trajectory. Despite surrounding claims to the contrary issued by people as otherwise admirable as Jacques Ranciere, and to whom I shall return, a number of these photographs were published despite suggestions otherwise. You can see here, for example, that Kristen Ross's uh, claim that many newspapers, including Le Monde and Francois, did not report on the days in the, of the events, did not report on the events in the days immediately following the 17th. And yet you can see here from the front page of Francois that this is not true. So I want to focus on a single publication for the moment, mostly for the sake of expediency, since it summarizes the overarching trend and categories of the way in which the images ran when they did in the press in the mid October. The Paris match spread is also of interest to us because of the ways in which it cannot but help to represent the dispersed locations simultaneously, generating an image of a city that exceeds police control, even as the narrative attempts to harness such dispersion for the purposes of justification. The cover photo shows the windows of one of the many RATP buses confiscated by the police in order to con convey the over 10,000 RSDs to one of the many detention centers across Paris. The faces of 10 men, and we can think about gender at some point, are visible through the windows against the backdrop of a few dozen more bodies, 
standing erect in the bus itself. In the corner, one man looks out to something presumably taking place on the street, his expression torn between shock and fury, his fist clenched in defiance or defense. The caption above their head reads Night of Trouble in capital yellow letters, and the story commences in a two-page spread near the middle of the magazine, situating the reader in the beginning as it is here constructed, the story begins, the drama arrives in Metro, making the protesters equivalent to the drama. On the left-hand page, under bulleted text reading, for an hour, the boulevards of the theaters were going, to a, were going to live in a nightmare. Thousands of North African workers had come from the unknown suburbs and swarmed under the lights of the city." Unquote. Two police officers in this photo watch as a single file of fast-moving Algerian men cross from the right side of the page, their hands in the air as they are ushered out of the metro station. Ironically, above their head, a sign points to the journaux, reminding, as if to remind them where to go to achieve publicity. The story continues across the next page, which is also split horizontally. As in the first page, the conflict is ordered along the sight lines of the police. On the top, we see the manifestors in one of the Grand Boulevard. Their forms are indistinct and obscured by the rain and poor light. They form a kind of mass, a mass as Leviathan. On either side, we see the crowd flanked by onlookers, more people who saw. Below, from the point of view of one of those flanks, we see the marchers moving in profile, hands at their fronts, eyes mostly forward. The view onto the scene is, samed, is framed by a row of five SRS riot police helmets, the black of which glistens in the rain. Our view is aligned with theirs, and subsequently, the story changes. Instead of calm, we start to see what might appear to be agitational cheering, swarmings of cars, and something that might appear like looting. And you would have had to have pieced together 10 different reports to know that these photographs are actually people scattering from gunshots. The page turns to yet another horizontal split, represented in oppositional proportion to the last. The top presents another dark image of manifestors being rally rallied together by the police. This time, they move towards the left, indicating indeed the story is coming to an end as steps are retraced. The light illuminates the center of the image, drawing attention to the ensemble of hands raised aloft as police, always with their backs to the viewer, watch on. Below, manifestors are sim similarly corralled into RITP buses stationed in front of the opera. The final image of, this es of the essay is perhaps the most jarring and is the most confusing as an image. It shows in rather close proximity three bodies lying on a rain-slicked sidewalk and several more behind that piled in the recessed door of a building on the boulevard. Next to them sit several dark-haired men, mostly clearly injured, blood on their brows, leaning against the Pierre de Paris, marked with the ubiquitous marker of the private interests within the public sphere, défense d'affiché. Most of the men look towards, look towards something that is happening to their right or down at their hands. The sidewalk glistens with rain, and now and again, something darker and more viscous, no doubt the blood that eyewitness testimonials describe as having pooled on the sidewalk like oil. In the right hand of the image, we see the glistening black that we have come to identify as the coat of the CRS, suggesting that we are looking just over his shoulder and more or less at the same viewpoint as he is. The caption repeats information printed with the photograph of, or a nearly identical version of it when it had run in uh, Humanité a few days previously. Namely, that wounded were waiting to be evacuated by police to the hospitals but we know this not to be the case. The bold letters here uh, uh, indicate that a few meters from the dramatic tableau, quote, all of Paris that didn't know was laughing at a comedy. So this final photograph partakes in a genre, a second genre of photographs that underscore this event a genre that we have to read as for reflecting perhaps the extremism of the FLN's image politics, of their will to represent the Algerian bodies as image, and their appearance of the ways in which life and death are both mediated by the image, their appreciation of the way life and death are both mediated by the image. 
The degree to which this image is opposed to the one with which, which I began, for example, um, of the crowd that's smiling in front of a movie, The Three Musketeers. Um, Is, is reprinted in the contemporary accounts of events, which indicates the degree to which it is the photos of catastrophe that are the most resonant, and that the photos of the affirmative crowd all but drop out of the picture after the initial events. So it's true, those don't get repeated through the 70s and the 80s. We do start to see the images of the catastrophe still circulating. All of the most recent and most circulated texts about the 1961 manifestation feature an image of police coercion and violence on their cover, confirming the treatment, confirming the sense that the most important aspect of the manifestation remains its suppression. Such a treatment continues to place the question of history and its narrative in the hands of the French, as opposed to those Algerians who manifested. Hardly active agents in the mechanisms of their own massacre, the martyrs are disposed of the agency they demonstrated so spectacularly just by occupying the streets of Paris. The images wherein Algeria is safely and comfortable at home in Paris are eschewed in favor of those that punish such audacity. These are some of the, a happier image at home. And now to this suite. Most famous of the images uh, that document the ends of the manifestation are a suite of photographs taken by the Jewish leftist Eli Kagan, examples of which were imprinted in Fransabs, L'Humanité, as well as in a few other newspapers. Again, despite the insistence in the historiography that these images were entirely censored and did not circulate until the 1980s. Kagan's photographs, in fact, have become perhaps the most iconic, and there's a book of his in the library if you doubt me. Um, while there are many remarkable aspects to about, about the 40 or so photographs that he took that night, the risk he perceived himself to be in, not the least amongst them, it is his proximity to the victims and the images he captured of individual bodies in pain that is most compelling. A sequence he took of a fallen man on the Rue de Pacarette in Nanterre, for instance, is crucial. In this photo, a man lies dying. An outstretched right arm reaches towards us as he struggles to lift himself from the cold cement on which he has fallen, his jacket splayed underneath him. The angle of the image makes the bloodied knuckles of his hand larger than life. Such is the effect of the distorted perspective. Blood stains the front of his white shirt and darkens the cement below his head. It runs in a neat stripe down his for forehead towards a dark brow, crossing horizontal lines where yet more blood has already pooled in the furrowed creases of the wrinkles that map the brow. There is an uncanny evocation of the cross on which we can almost see the man's body. The thick whale of his corduroy jacket is muddy and crusted, and behind him are a few visible stones of a wall. But past that, you can see more clearly here, uh, darkness and shadow. We see him from only slightly above, uh, close. He fills the frame, stretching from left to right, and it looks as if we, he just, if we just reached out, we could grab his hand and lift. And that is what the photographer who took the picture, Eli Kagan, in fact did. A freelance journalist, he had been asked by the FLN leadership to go photograph the events which they wanted, remember, to guarantee would be spectacular. Having already evaded the police at the Pont de Nuit who wished to confiscate his camera and film, Kagan hesitated for only a minute before deciding to use his flash to photograph what he saw. I won't detail too much further um, for reasons of times, but his testimonies describe the voices he heard and an argument that he had with an American photojournalist who instructs him to help and not just photograph. And so that is what we see him do in the sequence. Um, he and the American take the man to the hospital On the 26th of October, the photo described above was one of three photos used to illustrate an article in France Ops named, uh, with, titled above, you know, no French man can any longer ignore this. Since then, through contemporary recirculations of the image, including on Jacques Einaudi's important book of the manifestation, we have learned that the fate of the man pictured, his uncle in Iran having identified him from the photo as Abdelkader Benaha, a man Ainaudi found to have died head of head trauma on the 18th. 
No information was, of course, forthcoming when this martyr-like martyr -like image was published in 1961. A final image by Kagan is key to understanding the, pressure, the repression and suppression of so much visual information. In this photo, a bunch of men are being rounded up in the Metro Place de la Concorde. It too comes from a short series. While un only one of these photos is frequently reproduced, is, it is as a series that they communicate to us both the FLN's stake in manifesting spectacularly in Paris and the price of such a visual gambit. Taken without a flash from inside the car as it pulls out of the station, they are like a stop motion film sequence, their lack of focus demonstrating Kagan's discretion as he shoots hundreds of Algerian men before being arrested. In one shot, they are almost in full focus under the ironic words concord in English peace and an advertisement for the dish soap Rex, which only enhances the irony by alluding both to the whitewashing vision, which needs still to keep the Algerians out of public view, and after the facts, and after the fact, to the disastrous defense taking place almost simultaneously under the marquee of the Rex Theater, just a few blocks away. The next image, which is almost never reprinted, uh, perhaps for its technical inferiority, astounds in the sense it gives that the crowd of Algerians on the platform with their hands above their heads is infinite, never ending. Those in the foreground, the same captured in the reproduced image, face the wall their hands bowed beneath the weight of their clasped hands. Deeper in the image, however, the crowd of men stares out, catching the eye of the photographer and offering, offering their face to all those on the train who refuse to see them. Although it was certainly not the manifestor's intent to be photographed here as such under the Place de la Concorde, their intrusion into this loaded juncture cannot help but resonate symbolically. And not only for the irony of lack, a lack of concord demonstrated by the police treatment of the Algerian marchers. After all, as Pierre Aguillon has explained, the Place de la Concorde has long been a potent symbol of the unity of not only the Parisian left and right, historically, if not currently, dispersed across East and West, respectively, but also of the nation. He describes how in 1840, quote, this once disputed ill-defined territory, which was still seen as rather eccentric and unfinished, now took on the politically neutral character that it has had ever since. The obelisk of Luxor, a con conveniently timed gift from Egypt, was erected in the center of the square. Statues rem representing eight major French cities were arranged around the periphery in more or less the position they occupied in reality. Marseille to the southeast, Strasbourg to the northeast, et cetera. The Place de la Concorde, he continues, thus reflected a certain image of France, and it was incomprehensible that a square that was at the center of France should not also be, excuse me, at the center of Paris. If that is the case, then perhaps one of the most striking legacies of Kagan's photos is that it places not just the Algerians, but this subordination of the Algerians at the symbolic center of the nation, and did so in a way ostensibly viewable to the nation as such. For indeed, the photo would, become, would come to be the, amongst the most repeated, and to a certain sense, its image would exceed that of its frame, such that the photograph would reinscribe the territory in a way that the sculptures once did. And while it may not have been one of the desired achievements of the orchestrators of the march, certainly this reinscription of the space of the city, this plain sight, invisible commons, was crucial to their understanding of where and how the marchers should make themselves visible in the space of the city. We can understand the Algerians' insistence on their own presence in these same spaces to be symbolic of their wish to achieve the image of belonging, that avant-garde propositions like the SI map I showed a few minutes ago um, could only more punningly elude. Instead of uh, de Gaulle's famous 1956 statement, l'Algérie c'est la France, we here see the bodies of the marchers insisting that la France c'est l'Algérie, or rather it belongs as well to the Algerian. And of course, this is precisely the image that France needed to refuse, perhaps even more so than a, that of a police gone overboard. At a time when the war for independence could not be named as such, as a war of independence, the claims of others to the space of the metropole could not be allowed. In that sense, it is the images of the march, the plenitude and presence that they announce that are what Didi Uberman has named photographs, quote, refutations snatched from a world, unquote, that the French, and not just Papon, but the majority of the populace wanted to obfuscate, to leave, quote, wordless and imageless.
Uh, okay. I have about 10 more minutes. I think I can do it. Okay. Um, so this is a little bit of a dense part. It brings us to Ranciere. I won't make you look at those horrible pictures. So having seen um, all that you've now seen, you can understand how I felt when the only serious treatment of the images that the march had produced that I encountered when I started my study was a philosophical text that asserts the most important function of images was that they weren't seen, thereby placing priority again on the state that censored or the community that forgot. Now here I am referring to Jacques Rancière's invocation of the manifestation and its suppression in both his 1995 disagreement and again in his essay, The Cause of the Other. Both of these texts are central importance for Rancière's articulation of what he describes as the quote, political, and what he defines in accordance with the quote, unquote, distribution of the sensible. In Rancière's formulation, an empathic, even ethical identification with those who are excluded and not counted negate pol negates politics, whereas a disidentification with that which makes certain amongst us invisible, the police forces that excludes, for example, activates politics. Within his argument, September Octo September 17th of October uh, remains a paradigmatic example of such a disagreement. The quote, savage repression and news blackout, unquote, constituted in Ranciere's argument a quote, turning point in the subjectivation of the French. It provided a quote, moment when the ethical aporia of the relationship between mine and the other was transformed in the political subjectivation, subjectivation of an inclusive relationship with alterity. It was only, unquote, it was only in the disidentification to the state that had massacred in, quote, their name, that the French left was able to find an oppositional politics, the legacy of which Ranciere and Kristen Ross and instead trace all the way up to the 1968 slogan, we are all German Jews. Exemplary of the kind of heterological mode of subjectivation in which he is interested, the construction of precisely such an impossible we fractures the false collectivity of the police culture of ethics and humanitarian identification that dominates identitarian politics. Ranciere's invocation of 17th of October appears at the very tail end of his 140 page essay, uh, Disagreement. Here he states explicitly that all the bodies shown Quote, all the bodies shown and all the living testimonies to the massacres in Bosnia do not create the bond that was once created at the time of the Algerian war and the anti-colonialist movements by the bodies, completely hidden from view and from any examination of the Algerians thrown in the Seine by French police in October 61. And two years later, he amends slightly this suggestion, replacing the bodies that were, replacing the bodies that were hidden literally disposed of in the Seine and uncounted by a police order that would not and will not see the extent of the massacre, he replaces them with their image. Given Ranciere's preoccupation with the political underpinnings of aesthetics and the technologies, for, the technologies by which bodies are rendered visible, this makes sense, but it is not without consequences for his analysis of the manifestation and for the ways in which the same underpins a theory of photography in which photography in turn has come to underpin theories of spectacle. So the passage of note is in his second essay called The Cause of the Other. And it begins with reference to Jean-Paul Sartre's 1961 preface to Franz Fanon's The Wretched of the Earth. In refutation of Fanon's uh, words to the effect that, quote, the blinding sun of torture has now reached its zenith and it is lighting up the whole country. Ranciere invades instead. The truth is that this blinding sun never lit anything up. Marked and tortured bodies do not light anything up. We know that now, now that images from Bosnia, Rwanda, and elsewhere show us much more than we were shown in those days. So again, imagining nothing had been shown. At best, he continues, our exposure to them inspires moral indignation, a powerless hatred of the torturer. With these, unquote, with these words, Ranciere makes explicit the link between the photojournalistic reports of mutilated bodies, dismembered children, epidemic starvation, and other documents of catastrophe that were disseminated with such regularity and in his account to such little effect during the ethnic genocides that took place in Rwanda in 1994 and Bosnia in 1995. Now, almost two decades since those horrors, three, 
uh, bad math, it is something of a commonplace to refer to the indifference that the media engendered. Such indifference, Thomas Keenan has argued, grounded in the image and the constant flow of real-time information, uh, was it, that this uh, indifference was actually the natural outcome of an interventionary strategy which, grounded in the image and content flow of real-time information, did not need to justify itself on the level of politics, but could instead contain itself with denunciations on the order of ethical and moral outrage. But there is an important distinction between 1961 and 1995, or two, rather, if we consider first the very different flow of images, both temporally and spatially, that these decades mark. More importantly, however, is the different nature of the judgment at hand. Here, it is helpful to return to Sartre's quotation in its initial context. I'll just, I'm moving away from those horrible images. Um, condemning the silence of the French left in the face of mounting fissures in the Republican ideal as evidenced by the occupation of uh, Algeria and torture um, coming uh, from there, Sartre suggests, quote, it is really not right not to breathe a word about them, these failures, to anybody, not even to your own soul, for fear of having to pass judgment on yourself, unquote. Referring to the high publicity cases of torture then well known in France, he continues, quote, at first you had no idea, I'm prepared to believe it, but then you suspected and now you know, but you still keep silent. Eight years of silence have a damaging effect and in vain, the blinding glare of torture is high in the sky, flooding the entire country. Under this blaze of light, not a single laugh rings true any longer, not a single face that is not painted to mask the anger of the, and the fear, no longer a single act that does not betray our disgust and our complicity." End quote. So now there are several important distinctions between Sartre's words, his blinding glare of tortures, and Ranciere's, Ranciere's appropriation of them. Not the least important distinction is uh, is, Sartre, is that Sartre is not referring to torture committed by others in a faraway place, Rwanda or Bosnia, but rather in France and by the French. He therefore describes the knowledge of as much revealing not an occasion to empathize with another, but rather to hate oneself. Furthermore, at the time that he was writing, the image regime of catastrophe photographs was different from that of 1990, in the 1990s. Of course, there were ample photographic representations of the effect of war on landscapes and urbanscapes, and of course, on the bodies that inhabit them. And certainly these were horrific. But unlike Ranciere, who names as such the photographs of marked and scarred bodies, these were not what Sartre refers to when he describes the blinding light of torture. Rather, this metaphor alludes to the exposure of the French people. The motivations of Sartre's political empathies are, of course, not above question and have been the subject of rigor rigorous critique over the year. That said, while it is also true that he and Ranciere are both able to formulate only a model of French subjectivity, um, we should still note, and are only interested in doing so, I should say, we should note that the context in which Sartre delivers his is in direct support of the call to violence against oppression that he is prefacing. That's Fanon's. Ranciere's politics, on the other hand, actually depend upon the violence done to the oppressed, the death and the disappearance, for it is this hiddenness, this missing or this unpictured body that enables the disidentification with the state in his model. What is most striking about the claim then is that it places as a model of ways in which the French is subjectivated, the, the model is, in the ways in which the French subject is subjectivated would have to place an emphasis on the visibility and invisibility of repression and never on the visibility of those who were savagely repressed. Here, for example. Thinking it does not matter what is seen is an easy perspective to assume from the point of view, that is to say the place, of always already having been seen. The problem, in other words, with Ranciere's declaration is that for all its goodwill, it remains voluntaristic. Indeed, the bodies were hidden by the government and a largely overly complicit media, but that does not mean that they were not seen. The act of not seeing what took place in, quote, plain sight, unquote, to refer back to the Cole citation with which we began, is also a choice. Uh, 
And it is one, as the photographers, these, in, these, as the photographs, these instances of plain sight demonstrate that refutes a principal component of the manifestation and the will it represented to find access to a means of representation denied the marchers precisely, in fact, because they were not seen before. The manifestation, in short, waged a contest over the status of visibility, which, in this and other instances, became currency in the battle to belong to a community in excess of that provided by the name of nation. In 1961, the Algerians denied their, quote, right to the city, unquote, by Papon's curfew, as well as it bears remembering the restrictions of class and the everyday manifestations of prejudice, were juridically citizens, at least nominally. But they only became as much politically when they seized the means of representation from a state authority that wanted to deny them the same. In this sense, the FLN's image politics sought to challenge, in fact, who it was and who could appear. Precisely what Guy Debord would later lament as mere apparatus became, in their hands, a vehicle to cleave open the public sphere, and that is the photograph. Looking at the photograph that exists from the manifestation and looking at the ways in which they re represent another picture of the battle fought for national sovereignty tells us therefore not only about the FLN or the specific fight they waged against the French, but also about what it meant to see photographically and by extension to be photographically during the period. What it meant, in other words, to be represented as, as image for those who had been div divested of the right to be seen and to insist that they be seen plainly but in the spaces of spectacle as well. The photograph, more than being just a tool of subordination and domination, becomes a tool to undo the visual logic of colonialism, which is to survey and classify, and to suggest alternative models of cultural belonging and community. Thank you very much for, for this um, presentation, which um, I have learned a lot, and I think that I have to think a lot about that. But I was wondering, uh, when I was looking at these pictures, uh, but the, the period was also during the um, Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. So representation during the Vietnam War, which is from 60 something to 75 or something mm -hmm. like that, uh, the way that the, the war was represented and the way that the, the, those bodies were represented. Uh, do you think there's any connection with that? Or I was thinking also, in the Spanish Civil War, we watched uh, in right. the 39 and uh, 36, 39. Um, and the way that bodies were represented, Spanish, Spaniards' bodies were represented by French because they were the refugees right. that were in the camps of here in the south of France, the Spanish refugees. So do you, do you have any link between all those historical moments where bodies were suffering mm -hmm. and uh, being uh, put in a part? It's, uh, I think it's a fantastic question and the historical sequencing is really important. So in histories that try to account for images of bodies in war, those stories usually start in um, sort of two moments, but often with the American Civil War um, in which it was a, a moment when photography was emerging. So instead of sending out people to draw scenes from the battle, uh, <clears throat> photographers were sent out. So we have an early batch of large numbers of documentation of people mostly dead, but also fighting. So you see lots of you know, warfare. Um, and they served as a very, um, you know, a kind of information to those who weren't at the fronts, you know, a, a sense of what was happening. Um, and, you know, we're subject to distribution in a very different kind of media. So we had not, of course, obviously reached the media saturation that we have today or that we would have had in even by the 1960s that Debord would be thinking about or Baudrillard, et cetera. Um, and then when we moved to something, and the Spanish Civil War is a great example, um, from what I, what I know of that photographic history, um, a lot of it was meant to circulate sympathy and to galvanize European forces against Franco and that kind of, so they had a sort of come join us and became used as a sort of um, not purely representational or informational, here's the battle at Gettysburg for the American Civil War, but you know, this is happening next door to you, get your, you know, get out of bed, go do something about it. And so they were kind of galvanizing images. 
And again, the conditions of circulation before World War II, and then, so I'm thinking of people who write about photography and histories of photography, like Krakauer, who talks about what happens in the change of mass distribution of newspapers in the 1940s and 50s, as well as then later, people who think about what happened to the change in, um, in print media as newspapers became privatized a little bit later. So uh, before that post-World War II moment and the distribution of uh, photojournalism, images were more likely to be received by smaller people, reading elites, um, but did function as a kind of call to help for what couldn't otherwise be pictured. By the time we start getting to the, this falls, um, 61 falls before the great televisual phenomenon of the Vietnam War. That kind of reportage really picks up in the early 70s. Um, though it is a moment in which you do start to see in American photography a great number of protests and police violence, uh, especially in the civil rights. Um, but the Vietnam, Vietnam imagery is that which is, starts to spin off into the direction of the photograph can no longer function as an effective tool for empathy or care. Um, because Americans watched visions <clears throat> of dying people, horribly maimed, massacred, gassed people, raped people on their televisions every night in their kitchens. It didn't spur, it spurred a lot of popular protests, but the war kept going on. So then people started to think about photographs, photojournalism, as having lost that capacity. And by the time we reach, you know, what's, uh, you know, the, the first Gulf War, where we have live CNN coverage all the time, is really when we enter into that moment that Thomas Keenan is talking about, where, you know, there is no differentiation. So you don't have to appeal to politics or what an image does. You just have to it's kind of appeal to the sense of spectacularity in real time. So these images fall in a, in a, in a kind of funny moment um, in that history. Um, and there's certainly documentation of protests. Um, you know, we, we see the protests that were shot in Algeria earlier, 1961. Um, but they hit this moment between when, between when the television was establishing the set for spectacularity. And so some of what I didn't show you, and it's part of the larger argument, is that for a long time people took theories of spectacle, Debord's theories of spectacle, to kind of massively denounce and refuse the viability of the image, the photographic image, which became kind of collapsed in the all-encompassing aspect of spectacle, capital made image. And <clears throat> he's responding to the rise of television, which is very much happening in France at this time, all the images that I didn't show you. But he's not actually responding to the rise of photography. Photography at this point is becoming a secondary, slightly forgotten, not as important. People aren't rushing to read, you know, go crowd around the newspapers that first get dropped off at the newspaper stands. They're crowding around cafes where they can watch, you know, um, So many pictures. <laughs> They're crowding around cafes where they can watch De Gaulle speak, for example. So the television starts to become this place where mediated speech and image is taking place. And photography has a very short window of being kind of left without known efficacy. It does, it's, no one knows really what it does. But because of the rise of spectacle as a predominant aesthetic theory, through the latter half of the 20th, 20th century, and because of much of the aniconism that sort of gets built into art historical study and theories and histories of photographies, which start to denounce the purely visual, to think about the spatial, the temporal, we have a moment where um, the photographs that were circulating at the same moment of, let's just say, de Gaulle's TV, they became sort of lumped into the sum of that which is spectacular and that which is only complicit with the removal of people from their everyday experience. So part of what the argument here is meant to suggest is that there's this <clears throat> other possibility of the spectacle and spectacularity that is not only looped into the capitalist consumption of life into the conditions of image, but which is actually life granting and that before we could write away the life-granting aspects of photography, for example, in this instance, 
we have to be able to consider what it meant to photograph those who had not been seen and for whom being seen was a great political accomplishment. Um, so part of the argument is also that all the people who keep writing these histories saying, oh, the images weren't seen, they weren't repressed, or that they were repressed or no one saw them or we don't look at them, is a wave of generation of people who were led to think that images are kind of bad and don't, don't even need to be seen. They're already, it doesn't matter if they were printed, they're not really seen because it's just an illusion and so it's not part of an experience or attachment. Um, so I try to argue that by looking at them instead, we learn one, something different about photography's capacity to the image tactics of the FLN and what it, I mean, it really did organize a march that was known to result in murder. Um, so it was making a spectacle for political reasons um, and doing so on the level of the image. And I think that's, um, it's, it's fascinating. And, you know, trying to bring in other parts of the story, which is in the book and other chapters, really, you know, what is it that the image has to do with public and social life on the street, brings into his, the history in France of other kinds of policing and um, ways of understanding ethnic difference and the fears around ethnic difference, in particular, um, the Jewish population leading into and throughout World War II and perhaps to the present is still as well, both populations. Um, and there's a way in which the discourse about the Holocaust and the complicity with Vichy in the 1940s is sort of worked through a French political imagination during the moment after the Algerian war when it becomes easier then to return to the, the sort of guilt and punish the sins, so to speak, of uh, Vichy than to deal with the contemporary problems in Algeria. So it becomes a kind of screen, even as it reduplicates all of the same, exact same processes of purges and then accusations and purges and recriminations and official forgivings. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much.